Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I like a little walk-up music. I'm ready. <laughs> ready to talk about math. Um, well, welcome to the panel. You, you have arrived at solving the math equation inside our K-12 math crisis. Um, I, my name is Ann Wicks. I lead the education opportunity team at the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas, Texas. So if you're a Texan, come up and say hi. And we've got four great experts with us today to talk about this issue. I'm not gonna read you their full bios because you have them, but I wanna give you some good facts about them. And I need my glasses, of course. Uh, next to me, we have Shalini Sharma. Shalini is this, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Zern, which is a nonprofit education organization behind the top rated math platform in the country. It's used by one in four elementary students, one million middle school students around the country, and it's free for teachers online, good to know. Jessie Willie Wilson is the CEO of Dreambox, and she is a veteran ed tech executive. Um, lots of good experience in this space. Dreambox is a K-8 digital math program that's designed to complement a school's math curriculum. It's adaptive to every student. You'll learn more about that. Um, Bob Hughes is the director of K-12 education in the US program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has made math a significant strategic priority. Before coming to Gates, Bob led a network of schools in New York City, among other things. And finally, we have Kumar Garg, who's the Vice President of Partnerships at Schmidt Futures, which uses the power of networks to solve specific problems and then creates platforms to scale those solutions um, more broadly. He led work on STEM innovation and policy as part of the Obama administration, among other things. So please join me in welcoming our panel to the stage. We're gonna start with just a few stats. I think everybody in here probably has a pretty good understanding that we're not performing as well in math as we can, but I wanna put this into some specific terms for you. In the fall, we got NAEP scores. Um, if you're not familiar with what NAEP is, it's called, a, uh, kind of informally called the nation's report card. It's a test that's given to samples of kids in every state. It's done on a regular basis, it's been done for decades, so it gives us a really good apples to apples comparison over time of how kids are performing. There's one called the long-term trend test that's given to nine-year-olds, and I think the first time we gave it was in 1972. So that gives you a sense of that long-term trend. For the first time ever in the fall of 22, we had a drop in math, a drop of seven points, um, which is significant. It wiped out a couple decades worth of progress. When you disaggregate that data by percentiles, you really see some things that are um, alarming. So the kids who were in that bottom 10% of performance dropped by 12 points from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. The bottom 25% dropped by 11 points. Our regular standard NAEP score showed us that only 27% of eighth graders are on track in math, considered on grade level in math. So that's 73% who are not. And at the same time, we know that STEM jobs have grown considerably in this country, I think by about 35% in the last decade. People are trying to hire people who have these skills, have these technical skills and the experience and the problem solving ability. So that leaves us with quite, um, quite a dilemma, an alarming gap, and um, a, a lot of kids around this country who aren't being served and some future opportunities being foreclosed to them because of this. So with that, those alarming stats, <laughs> Shalini, I'll turn it to you. They're pretty sobering. How do you think we got here? And what do you think is at stake for us to get this right? Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, and thank you all for coming to a panel on math. Um, <laughs> We love math. Um, so, so I, you know, another way to internalize the NAEP data is that we lost 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, if you think about every year of progress that we make, um, we lost 20. So that's, that's a pretty yeah. sobering statistic. I think another way to remember and contextualize that is we lost 20 years and we were at best mediocre compared to other countries that look like us. So <clears throat> we're certainly not preparing our children. Um, and so you know, the question is, how do we get here? It's a good, incisive question. And I think it's actually the system we've built. So you know, when you think about, I, th I think about things like, how does Amazon get all these boxes to my apartment? How does this happen? <laughs> well, they build a system to do that. Right. Um, and, and what we haven't built is a system that's built so all kids can succeed in math. Instead, essentially, we have a system that sorts the children who either have an incredible passion 
talent, capacity for mathematics, or parents or family members who give them some other way of being successful in mathematics. But we don't have a system that's built so all kids can be successful in math. We just, we just haven't built one. And other countries have. It's not impossible. Um, it, and it's not that it's, oh, it's going to cost double. Actually, we spend billions of dollars to sort kids. Um, so, so we actually we spend money doing that with our assessment, with the structure of our curriculum, with the stu structure of intervention. You know, today, if you get behind in mathematics in third grade, you're just not a math kid. It's no problem. You, you can be creative. You can be something else. It's OK, sweetie. You know, if you get behind in third grade in reading, we don't say, that's OK. You just don't, you don't need to read. You right. know, so when, when kids can't read, we get mad at the adults. When children are not successful in math, we, do, we don't blame the kids. It's OK, right? And so, so I think it's ultimately it's a system we've built. And so we have to actually start to move money towards a system where all kids are getting grade level math, assessment isn't built to sort kids out of grade level math, you know, curriculum, apps, programs aren't built to put kids out of grade level math. Mm -hmm. We're measuring kids going to intervention, do they ever come out? What are they doing there? Um, and so I think, I think we have to start to say, let's structure this entire system so all kids can be successful in mathematics. Um, Jesse, we're, we're clearly not serving well, children well in math. We haven't done, from, done so for a, a long time, as Shalini said. Like, it's not like we were crushing it, and then the pandemic happened, and things really got bad. Um, what do you think that the students need from us, from all the adults who have power and decision-making authority in this system? You know, I was just listening to you, and I, I remember when I first got to Seattle to join Dreambox, I was invited to a presentation, and there were a couple of state superintendents of education there. And there was somebody in the back of the room raised their hand and said, how, is your, uh, how are your districts doing in your state? Hmm. And the state superintendent said, which one? Well, he said, well, how, how are you doing with student progression? in your state. Yeah. And she said, which system are you talking about? And he was confused. And everyone was confused. And she went along to say that for certain buildings and certain districts, they do a superlative job with educational outcomes. And they've done it consistently, generation after generation after generation. And then there's a subset of schools for which there's been generation after generation after generation of failure. And everybody in this room, she said, we are all complicit in that failure because it's been OK for these schools to fail and those students in those schools to fail and these schools to do well. And so when you ask me how the schools are doing, you have to ask me which ones. It was a really awkward, like, uncomfortable, she tried to make a benevolent, benevolent friction, but everybody was squirming. And I think until we become more courageous about outcomes based on race and poverty, and until we expect that the failure of groups of children, generation after generation, is something that will not touch our lives, then we'll never be able to answer that question about what they need. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to have a courageous conversation about the hyper-segmentation that's happening in public education right now. More segmented now than from at the time of Brown versus Board of Education. We have to have a conversation about quality instruction. We have to have a conversation about materials, equal access, equal opportunity. And we're not going to have these conversations. We're going to continue to squirm in our seats until we actually talk to people about their belief systems. We either believe that talent exists everywhere, but opportunity does not, and we're gonna figure out a way to bridge talent and opportunity, or we don't. And if we don't fundamentally believe that excellence can exist everywhere, then we're never gonna have an honest answer to that question, and we're gonna have another 20 years of failure. So I think we're ready to have that conversation, but we have to have that conversation with repre representational voices. And when I think about this conference, you and I were just chatting about yeah. this, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, it's primarily male, primarily white, 
no practitioners at the table. And I'm thrilled to see so many women. I'm thrilled to see so much color. And now we have to have a real conversation about our beliefs and what we're willing to do to harness potential in every child, regardless of what zip code they were born into. Bob, um, I'm gonna turn to you. Uh, Jesse was just talking to your boss. And she did a great job. Can yeah. we have a round of applause okay. for yeah. Jesse? <laughs> like, she got more out of him in an hour than I've gotten in a year. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait, Jess, you might have to give your, like, it, what she, you had a question and who gave you your answer last night? Your mom. Yeah, I called my mom. Um, she's not feeling that well, and I just called her, and I said, I'm struggling. I, I didn't think I really connected in a, on a personal way with Bill Gates. She's like, remind him of how, how he was when he was a child, you know? So we and, have Jesse's uh, mom to thank for that. Moms know everything. Yes, Bob too. yes. <laughs> um, so you all, after this, call your moms. You know, if you're able, call give mom. your mom a call. If you're lucky enough to be able. All right, so Bob, so the Gates Foundation, you guys are going all in on math. You've made it a huge strategic priority. And we know that people pay attention when the Gates Foundation makes a strategic priority, right? So I'd love for you to tell us about why your team thinks it's the right strategy what are you learning so far as you're working with grantees? What do you hope you're gonna learn? Tell us about what's, what's happening. Well, A, it's great to be here and great to see all of you and thank you for your interest in math. Um, I think there are a couple of things that led us to math. One, you saw today the passion of our leader. Math made a difference in his life. It's made a difference in Melinda's life and I think it can make a difference in every life. But I've been at the foundation six, six and a half years and one of the things that was interesting to me as we were making grants we kind of rethought our grant making process and really wanted to align with practitioners much more closely and not invent solutions in Seattle, but insist that people use data and research to solve problems that we cared about and they cared about in their own local communities. So some of our work you may know is the Networks for School Improvement work where we really said eighth grade on track is really important, ninth grade on track, one of the most researched areas that enables young people to kind of be predictive of passing college and doing well when you add GPA and it, 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 passing high school and doing well in college. And then that transition, FAFSA seems simple on paper. It's really complicated against all the cultural challenges that young people face, that we have and expectations for young people and how colleges actually sort to, to build on the earlier point. So as we were doing that work and looking at that work, math kept coming up again and again mm. and again. Probably 35 to 40% of our grant making was just organically moving towards math, uh, both in our work in NSI and in our work in curriculum. We saw that many teachers and principals articulated math in the ninth grade as something that was really a challenging on ninth grade on track, so that it's, it was both getting the math right, getting the instruction right, but all the things that were adjacent to a student's failure in math affected their entire academic career. It was in math in fourth grade, but then in eighth grade, and ultimately culminating in algebra, where a young person lost confidence in themselves. Mm -hmm. They lost the ability to have voice. They lost the ability to say, I am somebody who can make a contribution in the world with really complex concepts like math. And teachers and educators recognize that literacy you can get at home. Parents look at homework till probably ninth grade in literacy and math. But math is a place where educators make a unique contribution to the growth of young people. It's not something that parents intuitively know because they are subject themselves to math instruction that goes 100, 150 years ago. You know, somebody said um, very interestingly, uh, if we thought of a doctor 50 years ago and then we transported them here now, we would be stunned at how ill-equipped they were mm. to teach in the world. If we took a math teacher 50 years ago and transported them to now, eh, they'd probably do okay. <laughs> Like, what is that? Uh, particularly at a time when uh, in biology, in physics, in chemistry, there is so much math that's being created. You know, I like to quote Feynman who quoted Galileo and saying, and I'm not a particularly religious person, but when you look at the universe, God wrote the universe in math. So how are we disconnected from that reality and how do we convince kids from a very early age that they can't have access to the wonder of the cosmos and creation. So we're doing something fundamentally wrong. And I was not a math person, right? Like I got through math, I did the bare minimum. 
I did the compliance exercises to kind of get to college, et cetera. But I didn't love math. Part of the, the joy, and I was saying this to my boss the other day, of being involved in math is I am a learner again in a pretty fundamental way. Do not ask me to do a quadratic equation. <laughs> First Bad. outside, inside, last. I'm just, I took a test. I'm, <laughs> I'm a solid seventh grader um, right now because I haven't used math <laughs> regularly. But it's so cool. It's so exciting to be able to explore this area with educators and say, what have we done well? And what are we really proud of? Because there are educators across the country who are doing amazing things every day. And what do we need to improve to scale that, to make it available to every person, particularly in those underserved communities where the concentration of economic oppression is such mm -hmm. that they're not going to be able to have access through social capital, through networks, through a variety of other factors. So we have to. We have to think about teachers differently. We have to think tools differently. We have to think about school models differently. We have to think about a whole bunch of things about adult learning differently. So it's so exciting because, you know, Bill likes to say, it's so great we're narrowing to math. And I keep feeling like we went through the rabbit hole. And now, like, there's too many things again. Because when you actually stop and think about how are you going to address that whole child, that whole child's need, and then take them and pull them through something as complicated and abstract as math, super challenging, also though super compelling when you realize how math is both crucial to economic success, crucial to civic success. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to tell one poll from another poll right now. Yep. Uh, and I think critical to being a human being, understanding where you are in the cosmos. It, it feels that consequential to me, so I'm super excited for doing it. That's great. If it makes you feel better, Bob, I was not a math person growing up, I didn't think. I had to relearn it as an adult, which is also kind of fun if you think of that. Like, there's so many great tools, some are on the stage, but there's so many great tools you can actually relearn. But I consider my A minus in my final corporate finance class in business school as my biggest personal victory, because <laughs> yeah. I became a math person. You also give you, I'm gonna give you hope. You can do it too. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, Kumar, I'd, lo I'd love to have you talk a little bit about innovation. You spend a ton of time thinking about innovative concepts. Um, and what innovations are you hoping to see in math education? And what are, what are you learning as you work with your network and you're looking at this area of the field? Yeah, well, it's great to be on such an amazing panel. And, um, you know, I, it, it's, a, it's a smart audience. I see tons of people who are active in this space. So I think it's like, in some ways, this is a work that we're going to all do together. Um, I, you know, one of the things that uh, has motivated a lot of my work has been, so I got the privilege of working for President Obama. One of the things I did was I worked in his science office. Mm -hmm. And so the mandate of the science office was like all of science, right? So at any given moment, you were working with the folks who were doing kind of the future of biology, and they were getting really excited about genomic sequencing and the fact that the price of genomic sequencing was rapidly dropping such that you could develop a whole new field for how we're going to figure out cancers. Then you're moving over and you're saying, oh, the future of the internet. And what was interesting for me was I came in and a third of my time was doing President Obama's education work, yep. STEM education, ed tech. And the, when you sort of sit across the sciences, what you realize is that um, some ideas travel and some ideas don't. So in a lot of the sciences, certain ideas are constantly traveling. So you know, huh. you'll say, oh, this, this idea in computer science for how do, should we think about big data strategies quickly got transformed into biology. So you have an emerging field like computational biology. Let's find cancer not by developing fundamental ideas about the body works, but just by looking at where the data clues are. And one thing that I was always interested in was like, oh, well, like, I work in education. I, what are the ideas that are flowing from computer science and neuroscience and cognitive science into education? And I was always surprised that like, it felt very siloed. And I would, I would go meet with the folks who are doing learning science research, and I would say, oh, like, what are the tips and tricks you're picking up from the CS folks and everyone else? And they'd be like, I, I, you know, education's complicated. Like, we're like doing our thing. And <laughs> one of the things that I thought was missing was um, to take the idea of learning science and how do we actually understand human learning as seriously as all the other big disciplines of the sciences. And to do that, you have to be in much more active conversation with the other disciplines. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, I think you know, the conversation Jesse had with Bill is very apropos to this, which is, what is the moment we're living in? Why is everyone so excited about AI? 
and so excited about this moment. Well, that's actually a trend line that started 40 years ago with advances in, you know, what are we doing with semiconductors? And then machine learning itself was core ideas that started almost 20 years ago. And then an improvement curve that started with, you know, like things like ImageNet 10 years ago. And people have been working and watching this improvement curve. And if you, along the way, you'd be like, well, I don't know how well it can do at telling pictures, but then it can do that better than humans. And well, I don't know how well it can do on, on language models. Well, actually, it can do pretty well at that. And so one of the ideas between our, we created a program uh, that we, on learning engineering was we said, well, what's happening in computer science that if you brought into education could lead to a big deal? And so like my favorite example for this is why don't we have a universal dyslexia screener? Oh, right? from your mouth right to now, God's ears. Right now, we have voice recognition that is near human perfect. Everybody has a phone. Mm -hmm. the, the work that a speech pathologist does is incredibly hard, but there are not enough of them in the system. The work that you can do to be able to allow a child to read a piece of text into a phone and then to be able to track to see whether there are early warning signs such that they can get, actually get scheduled for an in-person visit, all those capabilities are there. And then I will, so the question is, is like, why don't we have that? And part of it is we actually have to create rooms where the folks who are doing cutting edge work on these yeah. new tools are sitting with the folks who are in the problem space. So what I think is super exciting about this conference is just in the past few months, you have this like huge interest as folks who are active in the, computer, in the um, education community starting to say, how can I use these tools? And my big sort of push to this room is, if you're reading about AI and large language models, but not actually experimenting with them, you're making a huge mistake, which is what all the other fields are doing, what the biologists are doing, is they are doing like weekend sessions where they will try to see what things can I automate, what things are easy, what things are hard. And if the education community kind of imagines a future in which these things matter, but doesn't actually experiment with them, it's not gonna get farther. So we're like entering this age of tinkering. And what I would recommend is like, actually have your teams try this stuff and actually put it to use and see what works. Because for folks who are actually trying it, a bunch of stuff doesn't work and some stuff is like magic. Yeah, it's a great challenge. That's a great challenge. And it, um, it leads me a little bit into this next question. Uh, Shalini and Justin, I want you to take us back actually into the classroom right now what you're thinking about because of the work that both your organizations do, you spend a ton of time in classrooms with teachers and with kids. Um, and so I wanna talk about what this looks like for them. So Shalini, I, you and I were chatting before about jobs to be done. We share a sort of intellectual crush on Clayton Christensen and that <laughs> principle, which I just love. I think it's such a, if you're not familiar, part of his research was around what is, what is the job to be done that your product or service can do? If someone's hiring your thing to do a job for them, they will keep hiring that person or they will fire it, or that product, if it's not doing the job. I was just thinking about Kamar, what you're just talking about, right? So Shalini, what, I know that, that idea is really meaningful at Zern, and what are you learning from teachers and principals about the job, the job to be done that they're using Zern to do, whether they need? Yeah, yeah we've, um, you know, so we founded Zern about 10 years ago, and <clears throat> the, it's true what you're saying, Kumar, that um, the kind of openness to oh, that's cool, let me play with that, is less prevalent in education. And there's a bunch of structural reasons. I mean, you have children, um, you know, we put a lot of trust in schools, and the idea that, like, people are going to be playing with strange technology with our kids is, is not the most compelling way to speak to, you know, families. So, um, so as a result, schools are, I don't mean this politically, I mean this factually, they're conservative, because, like, kids can't get lost, right? Like you drop your kids off and then when you come at the end of the day, they should be there, right? So they, they, have, to, they have to play it safe. Um, but we still wanted to 10 years ago, really, you know, Zern is the majority of employees of Zern are former teachers and it, we were built by teachers for teaching. And so we really wanted to do a job for teachers. Um, but that sometimes meant spending a little more time because if you initially ask them, what job can we do? And they're like, oh, Grading sucks. Can you figure out grading yeah. for us? And we're like, okay, but you know, could we do more? Yeah. Because while we'd be happy to automate grading for you, we were hoping to transform math education in America and make all kids math kids. And I'm, 
that's not going to do that. Um, but sure, there could be an app for that. But that's not like that's not really the transformative work we're hoping to do. Um, and so in this dialogue, you sometimes have to suggest things and bring things out. But I think what we've come to, and, I, and a, a silver lining of the pandemic is that this really has come to fruition. And what I'd say the job to be done is that teachers, principals, school leaders, um, district leaders, governors are asking for mm -hmm. is to help catch kids up and move them forward in math. And for students who are, who are already in a great starting point in math, accelerate them and challenge them further, right? Because, because if it's true, if our, you know, if our NAEP scores are showing us where kids are, that means the majority of kids cannot do grade level math. Mm -hmm. But these jobs that we're talking about and the you know, requirement for economic mobility is that you can definitely do grade level math and beyond. So how do we solve this dilemma? Do we let this entire generation just fall waste and just hope the next ones we figure it out? I mean, is that actually a plan? That's preposterous, right? right? That includes my 12-year-old, I have 12-year-old twin boys. That's a preposterous plan. Right. So, so those 74 million kids, we owe them like everything. And so we need to catch these kids up and move them forward in math while children like Kumar's kids who are like, blazing through Zern and just got some stickers from me, you know, um, <laughs> it's a fact, <laughs> but, you know. Can Makes you... the trip. What's that? I said those Zern trips, stickers make the trip. Yeah, they, I, yeah. <laughs> um, so I promised him at another place that I'd give him stickers. I, sh I showed up with stickers, but, you know, and those kids who just want to take off can take off. Yeah. And so, and that's what educators want help with. And they just, they want, they want to catch kids up and move them forward. Um, but, and I think the, the last thing I'd say on like jobs to be done, is that, um, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, it's, it's so complex, it's so technical. Mm, I don't really think so. I think if you find a job to be done for a teacher, a parent can understand it, a governor can understand it, um, a school leader can understand it. Like, we have to get those jobs to be done so concrete, so clear. Um, and so, so for us, the job that we're trying to do is we're, the students who are, pre are currently lowest scoring are gonna get to grade level. Students who are currently high scoring are gonna have a fantastic time learning mathematics. And we're just gonna, we're gonna get all kids there, which means catching kids up while we're moving them forward. Yep. yep. Okay, Jesse, um, what, what can you tell us about what your team at Dreambox has learned about uh, the supports that teachers and principals need when you're, you know, successful deployment of Dreambox in a, in a school? Um, what does that look like? Tell us a little bit about that. So a successful implementation, it seems so fleeting. And when you break it down <laughs> and you take a look at the schools that are really thriving, a couple characteristics are shared. Firstly, you have to de-risk, de-risk moving to your solution. There has de -risk to- De-risk moving to your what? I just want solution. To solution, yep. So administrators see risk, they are very conservative. Teachers see risk. You have no time, and you're at, whatever you're asking them to do is additive. And students see risk because they don't want to fail. They, don't, they want a positive experience that delights them. They want to have fun, like Bill had fun. So competitive. <laughs> and so the administrator has to know that it works. And, and in 2017, there were about 600 at, um, technologies in a classroom. In 2021, it ballooned to like 1,400. Mm -hmm. So now a lot of administrators are figuring out, what am I going to keep? And what do I get rid of? Well, what, what's the rubric that they use? And increasingly, I think the ed tech community is at an inflection point where they've embraced the notion that the only thing that really matters is what works. Not for a subset of people who had hyper investment in professional development, who had the best master teacher. No, for the average. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure that you're committed to efficacy and that it'll work for all kids and for all levels of teacher readiness. De-risk for the administrator. You have to de-risk for the teacher because the teacher has no time. You have to give them, you have to create positive gravity that they want to spend a little bit of their precious time with you. You have to acknowledge and honor that they have no time. And so at Dreambox, we d developed a solution that only requires one hour a week. It's five lessons. One hour a week is digestible to a classroom teacher. And with one hour a week, 
we're getting phenomenal results like you saw in the South Carolina results that we published today. So you de-risk it to the teacher because you, the teacher knows that every minute, every hour that she gives to Dreambox in partnership with Dreambox is gonna be a win for her and a win for her student. And the student needs to know that they're just not gonna be bored to death. <laughs> that they're, not, they're gonna be honored, they're gonna be challenged, but they're not gonna be humiliated. And so what we've done with the Intelligent Adaptive platform is to de basically deliver mass customization at scale. And so we keep every child in their proximal zone of development. We give them formative assessment that's integrated seamlessly into instruction, and that turns into an experience where we're actually adapting the pedagogy, so the lesson is neither too difficult nor too easy. And so there's embedded rewards. You wanna, you're getting success, but you're challenged and you're feeling, you're feeling like Bill Gates, you're pretty good. You're gonna leave your book on the, on the desk because you know you're on it and you want everyone to know you're on it. We can deliver delight and surprise to both learner and learning guardian. So we have to de-risk it. We have to de-risk it for students. They're gonna be enriched by it. They're gonna be engaged and motivated and delighted. You have to de-risk it for the educator because they have no time to give you and what you're asking for is their time. You have to earn that. And you have to de-risk it for the administrator. They have to know they're not martyring their community. They have to know that if you, if you say the recommended usage is an hour a week and we do an hour a week, then you're gonna get the kind of gains that you saw out of South Carolina. A lot of people, when you think about South Carolina, you don't think about excellence. People are gonna change their minds about it. One hour a week, de-risk it for administrator, for learning guardian, for student. Great. Okay, as we're winding down, I'm hoping we'll get one more question for you all, maybe two if we're lucky. So, Kumar, I'm gonna start with you. Um, we know the big money in ed actually happens at the state level. Governors have lots of control. We're sitting in California. I think their next budget has about 128 billion allocated for K-12. Where I live in Texas, we spend about 70 billion a year. These are big money, right? So governors have influence. Let's pretend instead of being at ASU GSV, we're at National Governors Association. They've invited you in to tell governors one or two things they should know or understand about math. What would you tell them and we'll go on down the line? What would you want them to understand? Yeah, I mean, I think that one thing I would say is that um, you, maybe this gets at the what system have you built? I think that in general, policymakers need to actually build a system that tests ideas, learns what's working and doubles down on them, just as like an overall strategy. So now we're living in two years in of pandemic funding and everyone's like, oh, maybe we should have like designed it with some sort of learning strategy rather than let's put as much money into the system and then create a massive cliff and then everyone is spending all of their time trying to give balloon payments to providers and then saying, well, good luck on the other end. Like the whole system was designed the opposite of a learning strategy and everyone's like, well, you know, it was a crisis. We just needed to act. And so I think the basic, basic idea at the level of a governor, I would say, is you just have to design it where you spend some of the money and then you double down as you start to see results. Mm -hmm. And then obviously there's lots of complexity underneath, but that's the most basic idea I give all policymakers. Design a system that can improve over time. Yeah, Bob, what do you think? I would just build on that. I mean, I think Kumar's onto something big, like the idea of tinkering. Um, you know, Bill started to talk a lot about evaluation. We're very serious about evaluation, but it's not just RCTs and quasi-experimental. It's also about A-B testing. It's about what can you learn today that you can apply tomorrow? And are you brave enough to share what you're learning today with others so that we can collectively improve as a society? So, you know, we've got grants. I know Kumar's got grants to try to build that tinkering mentality in with real discipline so that we're constantly doing the A-B testing to understand what we learn and then push it to scale as quickly as we can. Because there's an urgency in all of this. Everybody in this room knows that. I'm not going to beat you to the death with it. But if we don't get this moving and build the momentum of young people to be successful, we're not going to see change. And I think tinkering, as crazy as it sounds, is the only way we're going to figure this big situation out. Jesse? I love those ideas. The only thing I'll just add is that uh, I think math, improving math outcomes is like the climate change of education. We've got to get this right, and we have to get it right soon, and we have to get it right for everybody. Climate change impacts everybody. Math failure impacts everybody. And I think 
I would ask governors to invest and require that the things that they invest in work. Shalini, how about you? Um, yeah, so I, I would, I appreciate the efforts underway, and you see them a lot of governors talking about reading, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really cool, because a lot of times in K-12, we talk about K-12. Well, K-12 is about instruction, <laughs> right. about teaching specific things, um, and governors should be talking about numeracy, yeah. period. They should say, every kid in my state should be able to do math. Every kid in my state should be able to read. Governors should be saying that. They should be promising that to the citizens, period. So that's number one. And then number two, to do that, they have to shift spend to things that work, that things that work by subgroup analysis. I want to see, I want you to disaggregate that average because I don't believe it until you pull it apart. <laughs> and, and I really want to see that your system is shifting from sorting kids, assessments, interventions, apps that push kids below grade level, leave them there, to systems that teach kids. Um, and you, know, you don't have to spend more, you might end up spending less. Um, but, but making sure that you're not actually deploying dollars to essentially end up with the outcomes we have. Yes, yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I think we have time for one more in here. You all know this space really well. I know you're all tracking really interesting things, interesting people, practitioners to researchers to others. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you all could share with this room, if there's somebody you, whose work you really admire, a, a person or an organization that you follow that you'd recommend they check out. Why don't you share that with this room? Kumar, again, I'll start with you. Sure. Well, I. The place that I would, um, it's very much in line, the, the place where I've been most surprised um, as a range of experimentation is a lot of the work that's happening under the hood on high impact tutoring. Mm -hmm. um, the reason is, is that um, it, has a, it has a rate of improvement affordance that is really interesting, right? So you, if you're a tutoring provider, you can actually vary out which tutor you assign to what kid. You can, you can coach the tutor after each tutoring session, and you can provide all these interesting strategies pedagogically for what the session is about. That's like a lot of variability that you can then run experiments on top of. And so there's a, been, you know, uh, we've been sort of funding a number of different tutoring providers, but it's less on, hey, high impact tutoring works, but more on the fact that you can actually run much more rapid cycle improvement loops on it. And so I'm sort of interested in what will be the inter intersection between high impact tutoring and all of the excitement around um, uh, large language models and AI. Great, Bob, anybody you'd recommend? Uh, uh, Netflix did a television show on infinity. Um, you can see it, go home, watch it. It's very exciting, especially for us uh, former non-math people. But what I'm really saying there is narrative change. Like I think that we can kind of get so into the tech that we forget that there's a giant social and cultural challenge in what we're trying to do. So I'm 100% behind what Kamar's doing at times 10, and we're gonna try to fund a lot of that. But if we don't get a narrative change that says everybody's a math person and explains why that's true. So uh, you asked for a specific person. Steve Strogatz is my new hero at Cornell University. He is one of the great popularizers of mathematics. We need like 10 or 15 of them. We need them in every color, shape, flavor, big ones, little ones. Uh, we need math appreciation, crazy as it sounds. We have art appreciation, we have music appreciation. We need kind of math appreciation so that people reconnect to why this is important. Jesse. So I like that recommendation. I might change something I was gonna say to something else. So Dr. Carrie Wright is a state chief in Mississippi. Yep. And what she did in Mississippi, again, a place where people don't expect excellence, should disabuse anybody of a notion that you can't find excellence anywhere. So I would read up on what happened in Mississippi and read up on what Dr. Carrie Wright did. It's a great story of system improvement. Unbelievable. And kids thriving, yeah. Shalini, last word, who do you recommend? Yeah, I'm just kind of connecting the dots. I think that we should actually look at states that are doing very interesting things in math. We have a the privilege to partner with lots of states, but specifically Colorado. Governor Polis is here tomorrow. Um, he's talking about math. Louisiana, a place you may have stereotypes about. Dr. Cade Bromley, the superintendent, we've partnered with, partnered with him. They're focused on math for all kids. Tennessee, we're, we're part of their um, TNL core mm -hmm. statewide tutoring program. Um, we're releasing tons of data around it. It's extremely interesting. Texas, Mike Morath, the commissioner, is 
amazing. Yeah. Um, one of just the most phenomenal people in America driving K-12 in terms of impact, impact, excellence, and equity for all kids. And a quant nerd, probably. I mean, oh. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, like, listen to Mike Morath's testimony um, on the state legislature. Just listen to what he says about math. So I, I do think there are very important leaders in states to look at and to be really hopeful about some of the amazing work happening right now. That's great. Well, you all, please join me in thanking our great panel. I'm so glad you all are working on this. Thank you for your time today.